what I want to talk to you today about is about the value of design. I call it the value of design beyond aesthetics uh, because people usually, when they think of design, they think, oh, they just, these people that just make pretty things. But hopefully I'll be able to convince you that uh, design and designers are not just about making pretty things. And I'm not a designer, so please do not judge my slides. Um, but because this is a 90-minute class at the end of a very long day, I want to have it make it as interactive as possible and just talking to you and having a conversation. So please stop me at any point. I will be asking questions as well as we go along. So, you know, I don't want to put you to sleep. I don't want to put myself to sleep. There's like very comfy sofas just right there. So it's super tempting. So just go there and turn off the lights. But let's just have it uh, as a conversation. Uh, so just a little bit about me, where I come from, what I do, and why am I here. Um, I'm originally from Poland, but I haven't lived there for like 15 years already. Uh, currently, I live in Dublin, and I work as a business designer. I'll explain what business design is uh, later uh, in, in a company called Fjord. Fjord is a service design uh, company with around a thousand people with 26 offices around the world and they were acquired by Accenture I don't know seven eight years ago something like this and the place that I work in is quite unique is called the DOC is the Accenture's global center for innovation which basically is a living experiment uh, what the company did is that they bought this building it was the previous headquarters for Facebook in Dublin, but now Facebook outgrown it and they are in a massive, massive building uh, not far away. And they just put uh, 250 people, or 300 almost right now, of software engineers, uh, experts from analytics and AI, and designers, and they just threw them under one building and they're like, okay, just let's see what happens. Literally, we're just working on projects that are gonna have impact in, in some dif different industries and in some businesses uh, that use either blockchain or AI or machine learning or VR, or AR, whatever new technology. And then the uh, technology people are there to build it and the designers, what we are there to do is actually what we call ourselves as the human police. We just, cause it's so easy, like for instance, there is one project currently going on about predicting from CCTV cameras if people are about to commit a crime through face recognition and all of this. Yeah, this is like minor Minority Report with Tom Cruise. And then designers come in like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just because we can build it doesn't mean we should build it. So that's kind of the entire story. I cannot tell you now if this, if this is a successful experiment because I don't know. It might close down like tomorrow. I don't know. Um, so what I want to talk to you about uh, is uh, basically the design thinking process and the five step of design thinking process. Uh, I will use a, a methodology that is kind of used widely, but every single uh, design agency that is using design thinking process will have different names for the five uh, steps, but they're all kind of mean the same thing. So just show of hands, how many of you have been working with or have worked with or are working with kind of design thinking principles and methods already? Okay, quite a few, awesome. Um, I will also talk, touch upon in each of these phases uh, about design research, service design, and business design. And I will focus on the beginning of the five-step processes because I think that's where the biggest value from design comes from. Uh, and then the last two I will touch upon uh, as well. So again, it's late, it's dark outside, let's just make it a conversation. So anytime you have any questions, just shout them, just raise your hand, throw something at me, whatever this is, just, you know, keep this, uh, keep this going. This is a funny photo. There was a designer who just made a bunch of useless objects. I was like, this one of my favorite is like an amazing object. So uh, before we get into design and design thinking and why is it important and what is it all about, I want to just kind of talk a little bit about technology and disruption and the trends because we talk a lot about in this conference and around uh, the business 
area about, oh, how technology disrupts other technologies, and is like, oh, if you're not going to innovate, if you're not going to disrupt yourself, someone else will disrupt you. And we're very much focusing on kind of the business impact of innovation, business impact of new technology, of disruption. We tend to forget about, about people, about human beings, about consumers, customers, whoever we want to call them, about how innovation and disruption and technology actually impacts them. Because innovation and technology allows customers to basically seamlessly go from one company to the other. It doesn't really matter. Like, how many of you have maybe now on your computers like 50, 60 different tabs open? Right? Exactly. Because it's kind of easy and like, okay, I'm going to have... If you want to buy something, you know, I don't know, if you want to buy a flight, how many different airlines you're going to check or how many different price comparisons websites you're going to check? There's literally no cost for you to switch between companies. And that's all thanks to uh, technology. So consumers have these expectations across many different industries. Suddenly, if one company has a great... Uh, customer experience, service design, whatever we want to call it, you kind of go to your bank and you're like, hey, why this bank is still allowing me, you know, I still have to stand for two lines in a queue and then they don't know any, anything about me, even though Amazon knows everything about me. Why is that happening? We are having these uh, expectations, no matter what industry, we're going to be fixed on like, oh, I really liked this, so why not everybody have the same expectation or the same experience as uh, that company? But that's exactly the, the point that I'm trying to make from, from a company's point of view, is that suddenly, if you're in banking, you're not just competing with the banks, you're competing almost in terms of experience that you're providing to your customers with every other company in the world. It might be a bit scary, but this is exactly what happens, because for us now, we don't think like, oh, this bank is better than this bank, it's better than this bank. We as customers, we as human people, we don't stay within one category, within one industry. We don't say, oh, you know, if this is business is good, oh no, we cannot compare it to that business because it's a completely different industry, it would not be fair to them. We're not people like that. So when people start kind of migrating very, very easily between sectors, they take their experience with them. If it's a bad experience, they will take that with them. And sometimes, you know, because, I don't know, um, how many of you were flying on an airline and then they, lo you, they lost your luggage? And you're like, oh, what a shitty airline. But in the airline's mind, they will be like, oh, no, no, it's not ours. It's not our fault. It's the baggage handling fault, right? This is the airport fault. It's whoever fault. But you bought the ticket with the airline. So you're always going to say to all your friends, everybody, don't fly ever with this airline because they lost my bag. Even though they would never seen it. That's never. They outsourced it, outsourced it, outsourced it. Always. I had a friend who worked at a check-in counter of an airline at a big airport. And I asked her how many times a representative, an employee from that airline came to you and told them, hey, this is how I want you to interact with my passengers. This is how I want you to greet them. This is how, what I want you to say to them. She says, zero. Never. But she wears the uniform of that airline. The logo is displayed of that airline above her head. So if any of you, of any person, would go to that counter, and that person would say, F you, passenger, you would not think, oh, that, out, that outsourcing company is really, you know, giving me poor customer experience. No, you would say, that airline is really bad, no matter what happens throughout the flight. Because we don't think about these categories and these outsourcing businesses and BPOs and everything, what's happening. No, we think, like, we see a logo, we see a person, person is mean, the company is mean. That's basically it. So when people have these expectations that if you can buy something with a click of a button, if you get a taxi with a click of a button, why you cannot do everything with that one click of a button. We inherently, as people, are just lazy. We like everything just kind of like, uh, look at this clicker. It has two buttons, next and back. That's it. And I already confused it when first when I pressed it. But um, basically, like going back, if you uh, think about banking, 
you know, if you are work, if you are a bank, if you're working for a bank, if you're a CEO of a bank, whatever, you'll be thinking, and still the BCGs, McKinsey's of the world be like, oh, your main competitors are other banks. You need to compare your services to other banks. Because yeah, maybe as a business, this is your main competitor. But for people, just like us, we don't think like, oh, you know, I'm gonna have an HSBC account and then I'm gonna go to Lloyd's or whoever else. No, we're gonna think like, if our HSBC card is shit because it's not contactless, but I can have a card from a different bank on my phone and I can use Apple Pay, why is that better than the other bank? And I'm gonna be starting thinking like, okay, like I want to use that card because it gets to Apple Pay and everything else. But also, you'll have these perpetual competitors, basically these Facebooks, Airbnb, Amazon, whatever company you want to name, that basically gonna set the standard so high for customer experience that then it's gonna get tainted all the companies everywhere, you're always gonna be comparing uh, them uh, to, uh, to your service. So whichever one it is, sometimes you like, let's say Amazon because it recommends something good to you, but then you're calling your bank and the bank says, dear Mr. or Mrs. I'm like, what? Like, they, you don't even know my gender? Like, and I've been banking with you for 20 years? Like, how is that possible that this company knows exactly what I want, when I want it? And, you know, other businesses be like, yeah, I'm not really sure what gender are you, so we're just going to keep it vague, like this type, of, uh, this type of information. So I think from, we need to think that from our point of view, like from, from customers' point of view, we don't think in segments. We don't think like, oh, this is how the business works. Because that will allow us, if you're running business, if you're in a trying to run a company or you're in a big corporate, don't think, don't try to have that, uh, you know, business mentality like, oh, no, customers are rational. No, we as people, we are not rational creatures. We, uh, we just buy stuff because it's shiny. Like, oh, look, shiny, it's pretty and kind of, and that's, you know, the entire success of Apple, oh, look, shiny stuff, and that's it. Uh, so, for some reason, and I can say I'm guilty of it, um, I thought before I got into design thinking and this type of space that design is all about just pretty stuff. Because when you think about, oh, you know, posters or buildings and stuff, oh, it was designed, so it's pretty. A lot of people still think, like when I work for big corporations, they're like, oh, you're a designer? Yes, make my PowerPoint pretty. Just go, just make it pretty. That's it. They think that we make pretty PowerPoints. And if you, like, please judge it by this, I do not make pretty PowerPoints. Like, I tried, I really tried, but believe me, I do not make pretty PowerPoints. Designers actually do something much, much more. They, yes, they do try to make stuff pretty because they are obsessive compulsive, and they try to make stuff pretty, and it drives me crazy. Like, recently I was working with one of my designers on my team, and we printed a poster, and it was just slightly crooked, and they were like 15 minutes just, just I was like, it's a poster, no one cares how crooked this is. But in order to be a good designer, you kind of have to be a, a bit OCD, kind of. But I think for in, in terms of innovation, and what I mean by innovation is just creating something new that has value, you have to think as a designer. And I do not like to say the term think as a designer, because that implies that designers are like special creatures and they have their ways of thinking that no one else knows. No, no, it's not like that. I'll go through this, that design is actually really, really simple. So, but because it is about creating something completely new, you have to allow yourself to go through a certain process to make yourself comfortable with the things that it entails. Yes, it's messy. Yes, it's sometimes you don't know where you're gonna get out of it. But because you want to create something new, something that maybe some, never, never has been created before, you kind of have to uh, make room for that, for that a little bit of uh, chaos. So I want to <laughs> illustrate this by one of my favorite companies. It's called the Umqua Bank. The P is silent. I don't know why, don't ask me. It's a bank at uh, the west coast uh, of the US, uh, mainly in Oregon and Washington. And basically, they wanted to completely reinvent what banking is. As you can see, like when you, I would just show you that photo, you wouldn't say, oh, this is a normal bank branch, right? 
So one of the things that I think is really cool, in every single branch they have, they put a really big silver phone in the center of the branch, and they call them stores, that directly links to the CEO. So every customer, anybody, can just pick up that phone, doesn't have to dial any number, and the CEO would pick up. Guess what's the number one reason people call and pick up the phone to call the CEO? Exactly, just to check if that's real. Because if you would see a phone like this and we would say it co directly connects to the CEO of, let's say, your company, would you believe it if it's a bank or like your bank? You wouldn't. So apparently 90% of people just pick it up and they're like, are you the CEO? But what is funny, they don't know how the CEO sounds like. So do they just put like actors maybe? I don't know, like that would be funny if they would just put like a random person who's like, yeah, I'm the CEO. That would be very funny. But yeah, basically, they try to reimagine everything. What they do is that they build their branches in little communities, and they have, for instance, yoga sessions. Free yoga sessions if you want to have a yoga class in your bank. What they do is they have like a little farmer's market. So basically, all the local producers from around the area can sell their products, I don't know, honey, jam, whatever, they make some pillowcases, whatever that is, they can display it for free in their bank so that people can go in and buy the stuff. And my favorite thing is that with every transaction, they receive a chocolate coin. Like, just that tiny little thing and it actually matters. You know, so they're like, you made a transaction, here's a chocolate coin. So, but if you think all of this, this was all designed but not because, oh, look, they have beautiful lights and beautiful posters. It's basically, in this ter term, what design means is that they thought it through. That nothing is made to chance, that like, mm, we don't know, let's just see how it happens. They actually thought about the entire experience that they want customers to have whenever to they go uh, into the bank. And that company, this bank, is actually very, very successful. Before, it was just a normal bank. They was doing normal business. When the new CEO came in and kind of changed everything, they, they suddenly got like four or five billion dollars in deposits and they're growing really, really fast. Because they just, for us as customers, we're like, oh, that's a cool bank, right? I bet if any of you would go to Oregon next week, you would kind of check them out just to maybe, I don't know, open a bank account just to get a chocolate coin or just call the CEO or something and ask a question. Because it's, it's something new. We as humans, we like new stuff, right? We get bored very quickly. That's why we change our phones. We do everything just because we like something new. So this is, I think, a very good example of how a business transformed itself. And they thought about every single step, but not from the business point of view. Because if you think about it, either the phone or even the stupid chocolate coins. Like, imagine the back office of that. Is it that someone goes to a supermarket every day and buys a lot of chocolate coins? Do they procure it from, I don't know, a central depot? Like, what do they do? But they haven't thought about the back office because for us, as customers, we don't care, right? Like, how many of you, like, I don't know, go to a restaurant and be like, excuse me, waiter, before I eat here, I need to see your kitchen. Yes, okay, I'm going to tour the kitchen. No, we don't care what's happening in the back office as long as the front office and the front of the house is actually nice and a nice experience. And it's kind of exactly the same system. We don't know what they do to pull it off. We don't know if that phone is fake and that CEO is fake, but we kind of like it. I hope it's not fake. Um, so, again, uh, we're going to keep it super simple. What is design? And you can spend... Years and years in school, everybody will tell you what is design. And design is basically this. Help you find the right problem and solve the problem right. That is it. Thank you. No, I'm joking. Um, basically, design is super simple. It helps you to identify what problems you want to solve and then helps you actually solve the problem that would make sense. And maybe I will stretch it to a little bit that it allows you and gives you the mindset of thinking about how you would want to solve that problem. But that's basically it. Like, my boss calls uh, design advanced common sense. And that's basically what it is. If, like, if you have that advanced common sense, you can be a good uh, designer, good problem solver. So I love that slide because this is exactly what, you know, a planning and engineering and architect would do. Like, yeah, 
because everybody would love to just walk in with their groceries and then do a big loop and then come back. But if you think about it, like probably maybe the first two, three people, they were like, no, it's too pretty. I'm going to go around. And then the one asshole would be like, no, fuck it. I'm just going to go. And then everybody's like, if they, they go, I'm going to go. But this is exactly, you know, this is what people would think like, oh, this is how it should because it's pretty. No, but it's not useful. It's basically useless just to make that stupid. And you can see, like, when I got into design, now I see all these little tiny things that kind of bother you that you would see and uh, uh, you know on the transportation system like here in the venue when you try to dry your dry your hand in the toilet and you press the little button and it's like mm. it's like do you stand at 20 like what do you do do you give up do you like what do you do like all these tiny little things that just someone didn't think about they just like ah, bleh, let's just place it and we don't really care um, another cool story one of the hotels, it was actually um, McKinsey Design was working uh, with one of the hotels, and uh, they came up with a new experience. Basically, at the checkout of the hotel, what the receptionist gave the guest was a rubber duck, a tiny little rubber duck with the city on it, says, you know, visit again Las Vegas, whatever that city is. And just so that, and they were encouraged to like, hey, maybe, you know, you can collect them all, it's like a happy meal, you know, get all the toys. It's like the Starbucks cups gets all of them. But what is funny is actually it worked. They got retention 3% up. And if I would just tell you this, like, you'll all be probably, oh, that's stupid. Like, who would care, like, no, about rubber duck. But actually, people care about rubber ducks because they're, oh, I'm going to get another rubber duck. I'm going to get another. I know it sounds stupid, but as people, we are not smart. Like, as people, we're kind of on the other side. I'm not going to call it, but we're kind of on the other side. We, we like this stuff. If, we get, if you get, like, I don't know, a free token of something, right? You're going to be like, oh, wow, awesome. Like, sometimes, I don't know, when you, I went to, it was in, in, in Brussels. I was walking with my friends around like, you know, there's like restaurants and then they will have waiters who will tell you, hey, come here, come here, come here. And we were all like, no, we're only going to go to the place we like. The first waiter came in and said, hey, free glass of champagne. We're like, yep. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, free glass of champagne. It has to be good, right? It's so like, oh, we like the free stuff. So basically that was, we didn't think of it. Oh, yeah, we need to make because this is exactly the place. We just went because we got a, a free glass uh, of champagne. Bad design can kill. I didn't know if I should say bad, like good design can save lives or bad design can kill, but I went for the more nihilistic one. Because, yeah, it doesn't look very safe, right? And these, like, you can see this all the time. Like, so if you just Google examples of bad design, you will see, like, toilets made in brown, just like everything is in brown or something, like, and you'll be like, yeah, just if someone would thought about it. I think this one, just, they just bought a carpet. It's like, yeah, let's just put the carpet. We don't care but then actually someone walked on it. I hope they didn't die. But, you know, that's why design is just about thinking things through. It's just about planning about the future. It is about experiences. It's about all of this. But on a basic level, it's just that if you buy a carpet like this, just make sure that it doesn't cause, uh, you know, a hazard for, for your guests. Or this one. This was a campaign uh, for kids to discourage them from using drugs. Too cool to do drugs. Cool to do drugs. Do drugs. Because they didn't think that if you use a pencil, you have to sharpen it, and it kind of gets shorter. Yeah, basically, it's, again, design, as, as it says, bad design is hard. Good design is harder because, yeah, someone just going to put that on a, uh, on a pencil, be like, yeah, job done. You know, no kids will ever take drugs because I put the thing on a pencil. And we, as people, again, we like to mess with the system, right? We always like to just uh, kind of maybe go around, especially in Eastern Europe. We love to just, uh, maybe, uh, maybe if I talk to that person instead of that person, maybe I get something. Or maybe if I you know, take the train at this time and hide in the bathroom while the conductor goes and checks my ticket, uh, I will get you know, a free ticket or something like this. We like to mess with the systems. And you know, again, this is something uh, that, um, that makes that point. Um, so, but... <laughs> Why design is part, and 
Oh, maybe I'll ask you guys, because I need to drink some water. Why design is hard? I know, like, I like that the answer is already in the question, that it is hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that you might be wrong. No, no, you are wrong. <laughs> what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I would argue that that's why, because it's hard, because it's difficult for us to get into uh, people's eyes. Um, why good design is hard is because designers, I'm just gonna throw it at myself, because designers are assholes. Designers basically think they are these unicorns that they have to be, they are snowflakes, they have to be petted, admitted, and be like, mm, no, no, we don't disturb them. So whenever a company hire designers, they usually just revolt and they, you know, find the room, they make it a studio and they just kind of, you know, have these cool little stand-ups and whatever. And they're just kind of like, no, no, we're not a part of a corporate. Like, I can tell you, Fjord has been part of a corporate for the past 10 years. Please don't record that bit. Uh, they still think they are, oh, we are independent. Like, no, you're not. It's like, you, you know, you have to just face reality. But companies actually think like, oh, we're going to get designers, they're all going to just, they're super collaborative, they're just going to be working with us. But actually designers try to work together because they think we are us and it's them and they don't understand us and we don't understand them. So let's not talk to each other. Let's just kind of do our own bit. And that actually it never works. But I don't know if uh, in the kind of the design circles, a few weeks ago, McKinsey uh, released a big report called the business value of design and they tracked three million points of uh, design actions whatever that means a design action <laughs> drawing something in a piece of paper doodling when in a boring meeting that's a design action whatever they were tracking all of this and they actually shown that the return for shareholders and the return on equity for businesses that actually invest a lot in design is huge compared to everybody else but what I find is that what they actually said is that when companies successfully integrate design within their uh, organization, within their operations, they are actually much, much more successful than companies that kind of keep the design team away. I worked for a lot of big com uh, companies that the design sometimes didn't even sit in the same building. They, oh, no, no, designers are there across the road. No one goes there because they're wacky. It's like, but it's actually, you need to bring everybody together. I know it sounds like normal. It's like, oh, if we work in a company, we should all at least sit together. But if you go to any of the big Fortune 500s that you think they are run by smart people, no, they actually gonna sit somewhere else. Oh, because you know they don't. Um, I don't know. They wear T-shirts. How many times, when I don't know, I put a shirt and a jacket, and someone's like, "Oh, you don't look like a designer." <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? Like, oh no, because you're not. You know, you're looking like a consultant. It's like, is that offensive? I don't know. Like, so I need to look like a bum in order to be a designer. Like, what do I need to have? Whatever tattoo on my face that says I love design. I don't know. Like, but there's this preconceived notion that all oh, designers gonna have piercings and tattoos and you know, and old T-shirts and they're just gonna be walking around and be like, no, that's basically not not it. Again. Design actually makes sense financially. There has been a lot of studies in terms of if you invest in design, if you invest in customer experience, you're gonna get much more money because it sounds kind of basic because if your customers are happy, they're gonna come back to you. And if they come back to you, they spend more money with you. And if they spend more money with you, you make more profit. It's kind of easy. It's no one should be like, hmm, let's get American scientists to really research this. Like, if people are happy, they're going to stay with the company. Of course they will. But yes, just to kind of cross off that point, actually making, uh, focusing on uh, customer experience actually makes money uh, for, for the company. Any questions so far? Because I feel like I'm rushing. I don't know why, but... No? All good? Everybody awake? Do I need to splash water? <laughs> Okay, so now I want to go maybe a little slower because that was just like the big intro and now I want to spend time and talk about the design thinking process and basically what it is, 
what are the different steps and what we do with the different steps, and I'll give some of uh, some examples. So the five steps of design thinking, uh, these, this terminology is taken from the design school from Stanford because, as I said at the beginning, every company would have exactly the five steps, but they would just call them differently. And they have to call them differently because they have to differentiate from themselves because when they pitch to clients, usually you would have three, four, five, six different design agencies pitching on the same day. So just to make them feel like, oh, we have something unique in this phase, they would call it disruptive insights. It's like, what does that, like, disrupt, like, whatever. This is basically the five steps. First, you empathize. Second, you define. Then you ideate. Then you prototype. Then you test. And you can, this is not a linear process. A lot of people think that this is a linear process. You should start probably at the beginning somewhere in the kind of uh, empathize and, and define, but you maybe first want to build something and then go back and test it. So it is very kind of convoluted process, as you could see here. Like you just start with wherever and then just see how it goes. Uh, and you will try to uh, make sense of it. So I will go through each of them. I will spend, as I said, most time with uh, empathize, define, and ideate, and then talk a little bit about prototype uh, and test. But I think uh, that bit is, uh, I think it brings a lot of value, but I think designers uh, tend to focus on the, on the first bit and make the uh, engineers to, to kind of help with the uh, testing and, and, and prototyping. So to start, empathize. I love that quote by Yogi Berra. <laughs> like, you can observe a lot by watching. If you uh, are bored one day, not now, Google all quotes by Yogi Berra. He's the famous baseball player from the US, and he makes like the most obvious and the best uh, like uh, quotes, and that's one of them. You know, you can observe a lot by watching. But this is basically uh, what, what he was trying to say, is that we don't really recognize how much we can, um, you know, really observe when we focus on something. When, if you were attending the previous session with Tudor about the little noise that the ATM makes, it's like, that's so stupid, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, because ATM has to make the sound. You know that in a car, the little click when you close the car, that sound is completely redundant. It's made artificially for cars, because then they want you to remember that you closed your, ca your car. There's no engineering need for that little clunk. When you have the Tesla, when you have the new electric car, it still makes the noise of a little car, like mm -mm, even though it's electric, it doesn't make any sound. But people like these sounds. But we need to kind of keep thinking about all of these, like, oh, why is it this, this way? Why is it that way? Because people actually uh, care. So. The best way to empathize is to do design research. And basically, design research is allowing you to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and seeing how that would work instead of just thinking, as you said, like, I think I'm right. I think I know how everybody in the world thinks, and I'm just going to do it how I think they think. It's like, no, probably it doesn't work like that. that if I think something, they will think exactly the same thing. Uh, maybe just the fact that you were all tired. That's probably the only thing. Um, so there are three different stages or ways of, of, of doing design. Uh, there is the exploratory, generative, and evaluative. So at the beginning, you kind of have to start with the exploratory uh, research, which basically means is that, OK, I don't know anything about this topic, this area, this industry, whatever. I just need to learn. That's basically it is. There is no structure. There is no something. It's just like, I need to really dive deep. And if you need to start with Wikipedia page, go for it. If you just need to Google what is banking, go for it. Whatever that thing is, you just have to explore. A good way is to talk to people who either work in a similar um, uh, industry or are working in that service or are trying to experience it or whatever that is. Uh, recently, I was um, 
working for an oil company, and you're like, wow, oil company, no, I'm joking. Uh, and I actually talked to people who work on a offshore oil platform. And if you think about it, these people are somewhere in the North Sea, six, eight, 12 months at a time, completely cut off from uh, you know, having a relationship with, with people uh, outside of it. And when you talk to them, you're like, oh my God, it's like living in space, almost, because you have very, very tight group of people who for six, eight, 12 months, and it's an extremely dangerous job, and they have their own language. They have their own little you know, routines and everything else. And when they come to the, to the office, like what I found amazing is that when they have a little cups, when they drink tea, they would always cover it with a lid or something. Like even water, they would always have to cover it with a lid or something. And not like a lid that you can still drink from. No, 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 like a lid that completely seals it off, like completely makes it undrinkable. And I'll be like, it's in an office. There's a carpet. If you spill, it's a carpet. But they're like, yes, but if you spill on an oil platform, someone might slip and then break or fall into the ocean and you will never see them again. Because they bring that mindset into everywhere they go. So it was amazing in that entire headquarters of that oil company. If, for instance, you bumped into someone in an office, in a corridor, going to get a coffee, you have to write a, a letter, like a statement, a written statement about an accident at work because you bumped into someone. You have to hold the handrail whenever you go up or down the stairs. And it was amazing. Like I saw one of the senior VPs of an oil company, billions, billions, billion oil company, and a security guard was like, oh, you're not holding the handrail while you walk. It's like, because you, how always they going to instill the same behaviors that they want everything and everybody to kind of have wherever uh, they go. So at the beginning, you just go and talk to people and just you have completely unstructured conversations. Just get to know about what they do, what are the experiences, what they like, what they don't like, just to get yourself uh, accustomed with that topic if you don't know anything about it. Then there is generative. Basically, you're trying to generate some meaningful um, insights, let's call it, meaningful facts, meaningful uh, findings from, from these people. Sometimes you might just uh, you know, work with them on a much more structured level, be like, OK, if I show you this, what about this? How do you think about this? What do you think about this? So you're actually engaging with them in terms of helping you come up with some better solution. And it is a really great way of, of working with, uh, with users. I used to work for an airline, and I would talk to the CEO of an airline and be like, hey, CEO, do you think your airline is good? And the service, they're like, of course, my airline's the best. I was like, how do you know? Oh, because I fly with it all the time, and it's amazing. I'm like, yes, when you fly with it, do the people that serve you know that you're the CEO? <laughs> of course they know I'm, I'm the CEO. Of course they know about it. It's like, yes. Have you ever tried sitting in the back of economy that no one knows that you're the CEO. So pff, no, of course not. It's like, yeah, maybe if you try that. The same with like I've done with the CEO of a bank. It's like, have you been to your bank lately? No, of course I've been to the boardroom of a bank. It's like, you know, have you ever tried to open a bank account in your bank on a busy Monday morning, let's say? So like, pff, no, of course not. Why would I do it? It's like, yeah, because you're so far removed, let's get these people kind of actually interact with their own business. Sometimes these people, you know, if it's in a bank, they haven't been in a branch for years and years and years to actually see how it works. Maybe they've been when it's closed off on an official occasion, but they haven't really interacted. So you get these people to actually get them see what it actually is when you're trying to improve a better service, a better uh, way of, of doing things. And the last one, this is kind of towards the end of the design thinking process. It's basically, again, what Tudor was saying and a lot of the speakers today is like, just test, just show the people what you are working on. Don't wait, because designers love that. Oh, you know what? Wait a second. OK, OK, OK. I'm going to just be designed. Ta-da! Everybody love it. Look how pretty it is. Doesn't work, because then someone will be like, A, they would be too afraid to criticize it, because it's like, oh, they already finished. And if they already finished, like, this is amazing. When I work and I do like a poster, the better look, the better the design, the prettier the poster, 
the less feedback it gets. Because people are like, mm, oh, it's, you know, it's actually, it's already done. Like, we don't go to Louvre and look at Mona Lisa. It's like, mm, you know what, I would correct this, and a little bit this, mm, and maybe a little bit of that. But when you show exactly the same poster, just in black and white, people are like, oh, OK, it's black and white. It's not finished. I can write on it. I can change it. I can do this. I can do that. It actually encourages people to make changes because it's not pretty. Because they see that, oh, they worked on it. There is an idea. But it's actually not something that is totally finished. Like, I don't know, if you work on a pitch deck, on a PowerPoint, or whatever it is, and you make like tiny little details and then you share it to your friends and be like, you know, always in that email, feedback, always welcome, you know, I welcome any feedback, whatever. You don't usually get. But if it's just like, hey, it's a straw man here, here, bullet points, you know, black, uh, uh, black text on white background, just bullet points, whatever, really uh, ugly PowerPoint, people are like, okay, change this, do this, do this, do this. Because for us, we actually want to acknowledge if someone is doing a lot of work, and if they've done a lot of work, they're like, oh, they must have thought about it already, so I won't ask that question because I would look stupid. So it's always good. Yes? Usually, it's... Usually, you kind of get to that critical point where most of the feedback kind of repeats itself. The same is with, with research. When you talk to people, and you know, you talk to five, because every, that's every company that tries to sell design, the client will always be like, so how many users do you need to talk to to get this thing out? 10, 15, 12, tell me exactly. It's like, you don't know. Sometimes after talking to four people, the fifth person will keep repeating, maybe in different words, the same kind of ideas, the same experiences, and the same with feedback. When you show something, and if you're getting after 10, 15, 20, completely different feedbacks, maybe that means there is something to it. Or maybe that you need to take time and actually research why are they saying this. Because you know that famous saying uh, that if uh, Henry Ford would ask people what they want, they would say faster horses. Because they wouldn't be able to think like, oh yeah, instead of, instead of having a, a horse, we need a car. Because people wouldn't have that concept. So you kind of have to think, like allow people, if they say, oh, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. Like what they're actually trying to say, rather than, oh, this button is green, rather than this button is yellow, or whatever else that they are trying to experience. That there is something that they're trying to say. And if a lot of people might say it, in a different way, but they all mean the same thing. So a lot of the time, it's what, what I find is in that kind of uh, testing is that people go through like test, 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 test. It's really good to do three fourths tests and then take a day off and just, maybe not day off in terms of holidays, but to stop doing tests for a day and start thinking, okay, what these four people told us and then maybe you do a little tweaks, maybe do a little changes, and then you go to the next round and be like, okay, that actually worked, that actually didn't, and you kind of start uh, changing it. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions so far? Yes. Sorry, because the lights are so bright that I can't see. Hi. Depending if you want to be nice or right. So if you want to be a little asshole -ish, but actually right, you do as the boss tells you, and then you bring real clients to tell the boss what they think you know, about the thing. And then they're like, oh, OK, if my customers think about it. This is kind of asshole -ish way, because then the boss will be like, you know, I was just ridiculed by my own employees or by my own customers. But usually it's. A, if, if someone is, is hiring you, and it happened to me a million times that I, you know, a company hired me and they were like, change this, and they're like, we don't like it. They're like, then why are you hired me? Like, if you know how to do it better. Like, I was working once again for an airline, and um, the, the toilet was very dirty, let's just say. 
and I took a photo of it, I went to the CEO and be like, hey, look, your staff is really bad at cleaning toilets. And the CEO was like, oh, you did it. I was like, so you think I made a very messy toilet, then I took a photo of it, and I shared it with the world? And, like, and that's why you hired me, because you wanted the unbiased opinion, but when I show you the ugly truth, and literally ugly truth, um, the, he was like, no, no, this is your fault. I was like, then what's the point of you hiring my services? So I would say that if a company, a client, whatever, hires you and then tells you what to do, you can either prove to them that they're wrong by kind of alienating them or having a civilized conversation. Hey, you're paying me. Sometimes a lot of money you're paying me, and now you're telling me that you know better than just throw your toys and just go home. No, maybe not, but just kind of working with them. Usually when they see what you're working on and you include them, it actually smooths the process because, again, it's super easy for consultants, designers, whatever, to take the stuff and be like, I'll be right back. And after a month, three, four months, they'll be like, ta-da, it's done. But it's actually like, hey, I'm going to do research in your stores. Come with me and let's talk to your customers together. They usually will say, no, no, we're busy. But sometimes they'll say, OK, let's do it. And then they go like, ah, OK, so what you're doing is actually you're not just you know, making up stuff. You're actually trying to solve my problem. And this is a different way of solving the problem. So that's how usually I would say better to, to work with, uh, with, uh, with clients. Um, OK, so just wanted to kind of uh, summarize this bit in terms of research uh, for design. You have structured methods, uh, you know, like that testing or very formal interviews, or you just have, you know, observation. Like, I don't know how you, but I love to just sit somewhere and just observe how people behave. The best thing is that like a big, um, I don't know, train station airport, because people will be like, oh, where, where is it going? You know, what they do, or something like this. It's like super, super interesting. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So trying to create a habit or trying to uh, change an existing habit. You mean clients, you mean by the end customers? Or do you mean by clients, let's say, a corporate sponsors from a bank, let's say, if it's the? That's a great question. I think you have to use a bit of, you know, there's some that it's, some habits that are just, I would say, maybe impossible to change, and you have to recognize that with some of them, you will just not win. I don't know, maybe now I don't have anything specific in my head, but there are some habits that we are so ingrained in us that we're like, we're just going to fight it. But usually what I would say to this is that how you're trying to change it, you do it gradually. You're showing people that, hey, look, uh, you know, if that little sound in the ATM it didn't happen once, it didn't happen twice. And you start to talk to these people, like, why do you think, do you don't, is it about trust in machines? Because we know that counting machines have to make that sound in order for us to trust it. So maybe then you just, instead of having that sound, you're having a display, let's say, that says, you know, my, the ATM is just counting your money. Once I was standing in an ATM and there was like an older lady, and after five minutes of nothing happening, she knocked and was like, excuse me, how long does it gonna take? She just, yeah, she just knocked on the screen on the vein ATM. Because it's just taking it slowly. Because usually it's like, oh, look, this is how, this is what a water bowl is. And suddenly, like, oh, you know, there's going to be an opening here. It's like, mm, probably that's going to work. But if you take it gradually and try to understand the nature of that habit, again, if it's for whatever service, whatever product, people are accustomed to something or they're used to it because of a reason. You know, either it already works, so there's no point of improving it. Let's say this thing, it's, the main function is to change slides back and forth, and they actually pretty 
did it well. They have back and forth. And you'll say, oh, suddenly I'm going to do that there's a button here and here, and it actually has this shape or that shape. I might say, you know, actually this. There is that saying that if a product hasn't changed in 100 years, it's probably not going to change in the next 100 years. If you think like a book or a chair or stairs, stuff like that, you know, a book 2,000 years ago looked more or less exactly the same as a book looks now. A chair looks probably exactly the same, a stable, whatever else. So when something just works as a product or a service, it probably is going to continue to work. And there is no point of you be like forcing people, I like, don't oh, change because I think it's better. Because if, you know, you go and you'd be like, hey, this product's going to change you. But 50 people say, no, I actually don't like it. It's not like they're wrong. It's probably that you're wrong. You know, if five people tells you uh, you're drunk, just go to sleep. That's basically, uh, that's basically it. So, uh, a little exercise. We are tasked to come up with a new innovative breakfast product. I kept it as vague as possible because I was like, what is a breakfast product? Let's, hmm, let's think. It could be coffee, it could be cereal, it could be whatever else. So, first what we need to do is like, imagine you are a consultant or whatever, you're working on your startup and you're like, I'm going to bring a new breakfast product onto the market. First thing that as a designer you should think or I should ask you is like, okay, how do people start their day? What is their morning routine? You'd be like, oh, I do this, and then I wake up like this, and then I do this. Like, yeah, that's you. What about someone on the other side of the country? What about someone in a different country, different gender, different age, whatever? What do they do? It's like, oh, I don't know, but I don't care. It's like, I'm going to build this because it's going to do this. It's going to wake me up like this, and it's going to tell me this and this and this and this. It's like, yes, but again, you're building product for yourself. You know that there is that IKEA effect which is basically that people value stuff more that they created in themselves. That's why we like IKEA products, because we're like, oh, we told and we actually made it. And it's like, oh, look, ta-da, it's my you know, new bed. And it's like, yeah, it's an IKEA bed. Yeah, but I made it. I'll never sell it, because I made it. I'm going to keep it to my son and my son's son and everything else. Because we like products and things. We're proud of the stuff. You know how proud I am of this PPT? I was like, I created it. I was like, yeah. I wouldn't show it to everybody else, but I was like, yeah, you know, I'm super proud of it. But you kind of start making this assumptions about how everybody else should live. So in order to research morning routine, I'm going to research your morning routine, and you're going to research your own morning routine. So, how many of you wake up using a old-time analog uh, alarm clock, like the little one that you just press beep? Raise your hands, how many of you use that one to wake up? How many use, use a phone? Okay. How many of you eat breakfast at home before going to work? Okay. How many of you eat breakfast on the way to work? <laughs> sometimes, yeah, that sometimes is good. How many of you eat breakfast at work? <laughs> How many of you shower in the... No, I'm joking, no. How many of you don't eat breakfast at all? And How many of you drive your own car to work? How many of you use public transportation to get to work. And try now to come up with just one product, breakfast product, that will meet all of your needs. You all are completely different. Or maybe the, just the first one. Maybe just the first one. None of you use an app. So it can be an app, let's just call it. It can be an app that does what? <laughs> How many of you, yes, hit snooze? But again, and if you think like a morning routine, it's such a simple thing that you would think, oh, my morning routine is exactly like everybody's morning routine. But then when you actually start talking to people, like, hey, what do you actually do in the morning? You know, some people have shower in the morning, some people have shower in the evening. Some people, you know, again, eat breakfast, some people don't eat breakfast, some people, um, you know, wake up and hit snooze 50 times. Somebody doesn't wake up with an alarm because, you know, they're up and, and running. Some work out, some don't, some jog, whatever it is. And suddenly we have to, or we're told that, oh, 
you know, everybody will have the same, um, the same life that we have, so we have to design the product. Uh, there is a funny story. Uh, there is a marketing professor somewhere in the US that went to Whole Foods in the US and observed people how they buy eggs. And basically what he noticed that people buy eggs in a very different way in supermarkets. Some people just take any batch of 12, six eggs and just go. Some people look at the expiry date on the box of every single one and choose the one that has the longest expiry date. Some people open each of the boxes and look at every single egg because it has an expiry date on it and say if the six eggs or 12 eggs have the same expiry date. But some people uh, actually open different boxes and they create their own customized egg basket. They basically say, oh, this egg comes here, I will put this, and they basically make their own egg completely customized to whatever it is. But, but think about it, exactly how stupid it is. If I would tell you, if I would ask you, now, how do you buy your eggs? You'd be like, what? There are more than one way to buy eggs? Like, I don't lay them myself. Like, what, what happens? Like, I don't have a chicken in my house. I live in an apartment building. Like, you know, but now you'd be like, oh, yeah, actually, it's a good idea to take all the eggs in a different thing. So what actually uh, piloted uh, Whole Foods after this observation, they actually put a stack of eggs, of free eggs, uh, on... On a, on a shelf and allowed people to get a box and pick them up. And actually, that was more successful because people were like super careful about choosing the eggs so less eggs were broken. So actually, again, a stupid thing. We think that however we buy something, however we experience the service, everybody will experience the service the same way because it's the most obvious or it's the best way. But actually, it's it doesn't have to be the best, it doesn't have to be, can be wrong, can be different. It's just that people have completely different ways of consuming or interacting with products or services. So now for the rest of the talk, we're just going to design our... No, I'm joking. We're not going to design the, <laughs> the morning routine based on all these. But they are very, very different. And suddenly, you know, you just talk to few people or you just do this. Like, it's okay to talk to, uh, you know, do this type of guerrilla research and just kind of ask people questions. Once I was working for, a company, again, an oil company, I was hanging out with a clipboard at a petrol station. You know how people looked at me and like, what is this guy doing with a clipboard at a petrol station? And I was like, it's cheaper than just go to people and ask, and I don't like to talk to people, so I would rather just observe, <laughs> observe them and not ask them questions. But again, just with this point, I wanted to uh, showcase that how important research is because it actually can uh, show that we have very, very different ideas of how we actually uh, do things. So I wanted to show you some um, examples of ideas that maybe uh, didn't work. So, you know, the boarding pass on an Apple Watch, and they thought, if you have an Apple Watch, you're going to have boarding pass on your watch. What is funny, I actually have an Apple Watch. I went to San Francisco, the home of Apple, and at the airport in San Francisco, you cannot <laughs> press the... So, they, yeah, they didn't think about that. But what is an act? Like, you never think, like, ah, oh, I'm boarding a flight while I don't have my boarding pass on my watch. It's like, ah, oh, that is one thing that actually bothers me in all the flying experience. That's the one thing I'm missing. Because what are we pissed about <laughs> is the lines. And as you know, the Murphy's Law, the line that we are not standing in always moves quicker. So it's like, oh, this line? No, no, maybe this. No, 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 but no, this line. And then you go through the security. It's like, um, uh, am I a terrorist? I think I am a terrorist. I'm just going to go through. It's like, do I have a bomb? Like, I hope I don't have a bomb on me. It's like, and he, why do we, you know, that's something that happens to us. Like, or, you know, in a shop that you have the little beepy things. Like, it's like, oh my God, did I steal something? It's like, you don't remember? Did you steal something? Again. <laughs> this bottle, yeah, it's glass, it's beautiful, it won a lot of design awards for a beautiful bottle. But how many of you were like, okay, let's try to use this bottle? Because this is the actual solving the problem. It's not this beautiful designed glass bottle that actually doesn't do the one thing it's supposed to do, which gives you ketchup. 
because you're trying maybe with a little spoon you or no because the spoon doesn't fit because it's too too narrow so you actually take the knife and then you try to dip it or you just just keep it like this and you're trying to make it you know, just slow like lava and just like it just goes As, but again this is just design for design sake some designers were saying like you know what we're going to make a great glass bottle for ketchup that's all it's going to look pretty on the shelf but then people buy it, it's like, oh, how annoying is that? And then they actually figured out, hmm? Oh. Hmm. But which one would you prefer to use? You would still, because it's healthier. Ah, you see, again, our minds work in mysterious ways. Yeah, maybe because it's the plastic thing, maybe. Because, yeah, I 100% I agree. This one looks cheaper. Like, if this one was, I don't know, three lay, and this one was three lay, you'd be like, no, this one is probably more expensive. Because it just looks prettier, so you can have a, a higher price for it. But we all can agree that the user experience of this one is pretty shit. And this is my favorite one. How many of you decided to just hoover something in your house in complete darkness? It's like, you know what my Hoover needs? It needs a torch attached to it. Because when I go to my basement and I want to, you know, Hoover my house, and that's what I'm going to do with just a lot of torch. And what is funny, like, a Hoover needs electricity to work. So, because I would get it if there is an earthquake or something and you suddenly need to Hoover and there is, you know, like on a battery stuff. But no, this is actually a proper, like, an electric thing. But why would they have something like this? Oh, maybe, because you say, oh, behind the table, there is no light. There is like that, you know, in Lord of the Rings, there's no light coming from under the table. Like, it's complete darkness, the black hole. So you need a little hoover. So again, stupid ideas. Someone actually created that. Stupid, stupid ideas. And actually, it's like, what they try to say is that I want to hoover in places that are maybe less accessible. I wouldn't say too light, they're not accessible to light, because again, a black hole, maybe it's not accessible to light. But again, it was just the same, they're trying to solve the same problem. If you would give that assignment to designers, they would try to say, oh no, we are solving the same problem. But actually, they were thinking like, oh, actually what it is, is that underneath the bed or underneath the table, which is difficult to get, we're just trying to make a product that actually helps you. So again, this is all about don't assume you know what the problem is, even if you have it, even if your friends have it, even if every single person you know have that problem, still don't assume that that's the problem that you're going to solve. Because if you have you know, a million friends and you spoke to a million of your friends, close friends and family members, and you're going to say, okay, then maybe, yeah, maybe then build a, build a thing because it will have a million consumers. But don't assume. Always go and ask strangers. Ask people you might consider that they are not your uh, customer uh, target group. Because then you would ask them, like, oh, OK, that's why it's stupid. That's why it wouldn't work. Just try to go as far as possible in order to ask questions. Uh, never assume how users will use your product. He went for it. But imagine the designer. He must be like, oh, but I created this. Look at the perfect curves and the thing and like, oh, and the colors. He's probably spending years and years just thinking about the exact color of that. But the kids knew better. It's like, no, no we're just going to go through this. Again, never, even for a slide, you will never assume how your users will use the product. Because if you ask the kids, oh, you know, you're using the product incorrectly go and do it correctly, they will just look at you like, what? And we're having fun. If the point of the product is to have fun, they are having fun. They are, look, is it that one started? No, it's probably all of them. They're like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Do parents approve of this? Probably not. But do kids care? No, they don't. But again, just, don't, I love this one. It's like, 
I, you just went for it. But again, don't ever assume how your users will use the product because you never you can you never know how will they use the product. So, what is a really good way of selling design or talking about design to either your own team because many times what designers think is that they will have to go and, and you know, get the buy-in from somewhere else. No, it's usually the person next to you or your line manager who will be like, oh, I don't need this crap, I don't need this. Actually, design helps you very quickly to validate if the idea is correct. So if you're thinking about a uh, new product, a new service, if you're thinking about launching a startup, don't invest all the time, all the money, quit your job and everything. Just spend a Saturday or a Sunday just think who your customers might be and just go and talk to them and be like, hey, if I would do this, what would you think about it? Or what is your exactly problem? Do you, I think your problem is this, and I think of solving it like this. What do you think? And that doesn't cost you anything. It will take one day, and you can actually learn so much and save so much time and so much money and so much risk just by talking to people exactly about what you assume their problem is and how do you want to uh, solve it. Before we move to the second bit, any questions? Yeah. You decide, and then you go and validate that idea or that assumption. You think, my product will be the most useful for these type of people, whatever you're going to categorize them by location, gender, income, whatever that is. And then you find people like the ones that you thought about, and then you ask them, hey, I think that person like you is going to like my product because of A, B, C, and because of your problems, D, Y, uh, and stuff. And then they'll be like, oh, no, that's not my problem. Then we'll be like, oh, OK, thank you. So then if you still want to target that audience, then you actually be like, OK, I thought that you have a problem, which is this. You're telling me you have a different problem. Let's work like this. Or you're trying to find the exact, if you think like, oh, yes, I definitely know there's something, but I just don't know who is the target audience. You just go and try to find the right target audience for your product by asking and engaging with them. If you think about, I don't know, um, a certain toy, let's say, anything, it's going to be great for girls, but you see uh, girls are actually not interested in it. Boys like it or something like this or this age or that age. So you, you can just come up with it. Like, you know, just I think it's going to be this. And you just go there. Just ask these people, find them, and you just, and you just make sure that, uh, that that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then either you stick with that target group or you try to find a new target group. I think, again, just by interacting with those people that you're trying to profile. Because, again, if I was like, I want to you know, create a breakfast product for people who attend conferences in Bucharest when it snows, let's say, you know, and then I asked all of you because, hey, you're here. And then it's like, oh, you are completely different than I thought it is. So now I either go to a different conference when it snows and I ask different people about this. Or actually, like, no, you know what? You know what's the problem? Is no, I'm not going to say what's the problem. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions before we move on? No. I need to. Okay, it's quarter to six. Sorry, guys. And there's like just went one through. No. Uh, I will. I will move forward. So maybe. No questions. I will just go through one, two, three, four. I'll just go through all of the slides. There's like 80 more slides. No, I'm joking. Um, so define. Basically, what it means is that you, we went, we talked to everybody, we saw everything that there needs to be seen, and we experienced it. Now we actually have to gather it all up and actually make sense out of it. We had tons and tons of recordings of interviews and everything. We actually have to make uh, sense of it and just come up with that one uh, problem statement. So problem statement is very easy. It has to start with the human. You're actually solving a problem for a human. 
I love that companies come in and like, you know, my problem statement is how AI can help to, like, no, that you're starting with the solution that it has to be AI. You have to say, my target audience, my target customers have that problem, and this is what I'm trying to sell. So always your problem statement has to start with who are you solving for in terms of humans and what you're trying to help them with. It has to be broad enough for creative freedom. You cannot say again, like, it has to be this, because that means you're defining it already very, very uh, narrowly. And it cannot be narrow enough. Uh, it has to be narrow enough, because you cannot say, uh, you know, how might we change the world for the better? Like, that's, you can work on it, and I applaud you for that, but that's probably not going to, you know, take um, as, as, as little time as you think. It's going to be very, very uh, difficult. So it has to be just at the right time, has to be around people, has to be broad enough, so you have to think about how people will uh, think about it, but also has to be narrow enough, so you don't want to change, you know, everything uh, at the stroke of a button. Uh, a little bit talk to you, uh, I know Tudor talked about service design, I want to talk to you, again, a plane. As you can see, like, I like planes. Um, I don't like planes like this, because I think, you know, the older the plane, I think, no, okay. Um, so when we think about, you know, what is involved in a plane ride, actually, we think, oh, maybe it's just a flight, maybe it's the airport experience. But actually, if you're trying to map it out, it takes a lot. It's about how do you plan it? It's about how you purchase the tickets in the entire experience. What do you do pre-trip? How do you get through security? How do you fly? What do you do during flight? How do you arrive? What do you do when you get out of the airport? What do you do in, at the destination? How do you then reflect about this trip? What do you, would you change? What would you differently? Where would you go? Why would you change that? All of this is different. If you think about all the different touch points and interactions that a person would have at any moment in journey, you would have everything from phones to desktops for people to mobiles, everything. And then suddenly you have to design and think about each of these, uh, of these interactions. You have to think about uh, the KPIs. You have to think about the different uh, displays, all the insights, all the levers. This is actually what my company did for one of the airlines in terms of what actually goes through an airline experience for a passenger. And suddenly, what that makes, what the biggest value of this is, is that you can bring every people from the entire company, from operations, finance, customer service, CEOs, whoever, flight attendants, pilots, and be like, hey, look, this is what your customers go through, and you actually allow people to look at a problem within the kind of context and the world that it lives in. It's like, hey, look, this is actually where the problem is. This is not just you know, you lost your bag, so that's the problem, you lost your bag. It's like, how does that impact the, you know, what happens to the destination when you don't have your underwear and your, you know, and your luggage for the next five days because the baggage was lost? All of this. So you kind of have to look at it from uh, a very, very holistic uh, perspective and just kind of let you zoom out. And I think that's the biggest value of service design is that it lets you just step out and be like, hey, look, this is the entire organization. This is the entire experience. And this is who interacts with it at a different time. This is what people think about it. I would encourage you to Google one day the IKEA uh, service blueprint or the customer journey. And basically, they engineered how they want to make you feel about IKEA. So IKEA always makes smaller car parks for people because they want you to be a little frustrated when you get into Ikea, because then you get into Ikea, it's nice and plush, it's like, oh, it's nice. Why are these ice creams and the hot dogs at the end? Because they want you at the end to have a positive experience. They always, no matter happens, you know, how you spend just money, they were like, you want you, they want you to remember the ice cream, the 99p whatever ice cream, because they're like, oh, look, uh, that's the ice cream. They manipulate you. And you can actually see and, and read through, uh, if you Google it, how IKEA is manipulating you in order to kind of go through uh, the entire experience. Quickly, ideate. I can ask you this. What's the answer to this question? Oh, I know it's 6 o'clock, but come on, guys. <laughs> yes. But if I would ask you to solve this, 
you get to the same answer in both. This arrives you to the same answer. This gets you to the same answer. Which one allows you for more freedom, creativity? Why? Because how many answers are possible in this equation? Infinite, right? You can go with the fractions, wherever you want to go. You can have infinite numbers. You'll always arrive at the same. That's what I usually do as a kind of like a brain teaser to uh, when I work, when I do like a workshops and stuff like that. And I give this equation to people and like come up with as many as possible. And they write and they write and they write because they're like, oh, suddenly I can do this and I can do fractions and I can do, you know, all these different uh, weird numbers and I can do this. I can do negative numbers. I can do this. I can do that. It just kind of allows you to uh, think about it. If we have time, maybe 15, 20 seconds, think of as many round objects as you can. Usually this happens on a piece of paper. I give people like empty circles and ask them to draw on every empty circle like a round object, like a type of fruit or a type of a ball or a type of a thing. Just think for a second. I have 14 minutes. I'll try to go it quickly so then we can actually have a talk. Okay, how many of you thought of the planet Earth? How many of those people thought also of planet Mars? Few. Why? Because we think, oh, it's too easy, right? Or the same if you thought about a basketball, you'd be like, oh, okay, I already thought of one type of a ball. I'm not going to think of a volleyball because, no, that's too easy, right? I will be judged. It's too easy. I'll think of, I don't know, an orange, and it's like, oh, I'm not going to think of a watermelon because, again, it's the same category. I'm, I'm going to be judged if I tell people. You have to be original. You have to think about all these different things. But in this, there's absolutely zero to tell you that you cannot just go with all the planets, all the stars, every single fruit, the round fruit that there is, every single type of a ball, every single type of a wheel, everything. You just censor yourself. But that is the most damaging thing you can do in a design thinking or in, I would say in, in life. It's, you're just censoring yourself. You're like, oh, I have to come with something better. But that was not the point of this exercise. The point was just come up with as many as possible. And every single person does it. They always just censor themselves and be like, mm, no, yeah, I maybe go with you know, two in the same category, but not three, because that would be cheating. And it's like, there is no point, because, again, don't censor yourself. When there is ideation, you just come up with ideas. I was working for a car manufacturer, and they were thinking about you know, engineering ideas. I said, what if we put a nuclear reactor in a car? They all looked at me it's like, whoa, a crazy person. It's like ideas, right? I didn't say they have to be feasible, I just said it has to be an idea, so why don't we just put a nuclear reactor in a car? It would be warm, it would be... But again, you just have to just think as much as possible about crazy ideas, because sometimes a crazy idea that you have, someone might thought about a different type of the same idea that may be a less crazy, and when you combine the two, the X and Y, actually gets you to the right answer. But if you think, because we as people, we think like, if I don't come up with the right answer, no one else will. But it's like making puzzles. It's, it's collaboration is better. I have this piece of puzzle, you have this, and someone else has this. If you are trying to assemble the picture with just one piece of puzzle yourself, they'll be like, that's not a great picture. But you combine together and be like, okay, I have a little this, I'm thinking about this, you're thinking about this, you're doing this. Actually, it helps. You just have to collaborate, you have to talk to people, you just don't have to be an asshole, that's basically, no. Um, so, you know, you can do many different ideation methods, you can co-create, you can brainstorm, you can do everything, just get people out of their comfort zone and start making them think about ideas. A good way is if you're working in a specific office all the time and you want your team to think about new ideas, don't make them think in the same space that they always think 24-7, always when they do it at work. Take them to bowling alley, take them drinking, and just write down their drunk ideas. And then whatever that is, just get them in a different space, make them do something that they haven't been doing. Because again, we are simple creatures. If 
people start even physically doing something they haven't done, their brains work in a different way, so they will be coming up with new ideas. Just don't make them feel like they have to come up with something on the spot, like, oh, I don't, I don't know, but I have to come up with a new idea, right? And it has to be the right idea. We always think, like, my idea always has to be the right idea. Um, okay, a little bit about business design, because I'm a business designer, so I should know what business design is. But before I tell you what business design is, and I don't know what it is, um, anybody of you know what business design is? Yep, you look like my boss. No one knows now. <laughs> um, business design has been talked and talked. It's like, oh, it's someone who is thinking like this, but is also doing this. <laughs> I met so many business designers, no one still knows what business designers actually do, which I think is the great way because they can create their own role. But I think it's very, very valuable, especially in the space of innovation and startups and stuff like that. Basically, they think of the ideas and they think of them in a much more grounded, skeptical way. If someone thinks, you know, of that nuclear uh, reactor in a car, business designer would actually start thinking of it and talking and validating it as a business idea. They would call North Korea and be like, how much is plutonium? Uh, and maybe not that, that's, that's research, so no, we passed that, so you wouldn't call North Korea and ask about how much is plutonium. But you would start thinking about it. what do you need to get it to, to actually run, to make it feasible. Like, a great idea, you know, if you have tech and you're building tech and you're doing all of this, but you haven't thought is actually, can I scale it? Can I make money out of it? Can people buy it and all of this thing? You actually have to just prototype maybe a way of uh, doing, uh, doing business. So also what business designers do, they design organizations. Like a lot of things you would think that companies, they're like, oh, we're gonna, AI will solve everything. Actually, what would solve is that you get this team and this team so closer together so they can go for lunch and think about stuff together. You don't need AI for this, you just need a different office furniture, let's say. And they're like, oh, really, that's, that's what it is, but we had millions and millions on AI. So actually start thinking about, again, humans. It's like, I heard it in the startup, a uh, session with the VCs about even VCs and startup. It's just human to human. There's no B2B, there's no B2C. It's human to human. When you're investing in a startup or in startup or you want to be invested in, you're basically talking to another human being. You're not talking to this organization, this, all of this. You're just talking to another human being. And that's all it is. So you have to get understanding and start thinking about it from that perspective, even when you're working with companies, when you're working with corporates, you're just dealing with people. Some are nice people, some are not nice people, and there's no point of arguing, oh, you need to do this because I tell you. Like, some people, you're just not going to be working with you, and that's fine. What is also, I think that's the, the, the holy grail of design, is to coming up with how do you measure the value of design? How do you measure if something is successful design, something is not a success? in design, and there are many different ways you can look at traditional KPIs, you can think about price points, you can think about how do you want to make sure that design should be impactful, but it always should have a purpose. You shouldn't just make something pretty, let's say, for the sake of it, or make pretty. If you wanted to do it yourself, if you have the resources, go for it, but don't spend the time and the money and the resources just making something if you don't know why you're doing it. Um, what I wanted to tell you maybe I'll just skip through this, is the prototyping of a business, because I think that's relevant for, for startups and uh, for early companies. It's basically, when you're trying to come up, you're coming up with an idea, it's like, okay, I'm gonna you know, get all the people, and I'm gonna hire, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna build a product, I'm gonna do this. It's like, yes, but you can actually do a little lemonade stand. Literally, you can just take a cardboard box, put it on front of your house on a street and say, I'm selling this, put a price and see if people come. You can do a, a fake ad on Google or on 
uh, Facebook or something, say, hey, you know, and you just put the landing page and say, hey, that's my product, interested, sign up. And you just get the email addresses and the people, and then you kind of forget because these people would forget, whatever that is. But then literally in a few days, you can get validation if you would get customers, if you build what you said that you're going to build very, very easily. There is so many different ways of basically just instead of building the entire infrastructure and doing all of this, spending all of that money, you just prototype that business. You're just trying very, very quickly and very, very cheaply to do it. You can get in a local mall, like an abandoned store, and you just you know, pretend that you have a store. You can do a, um, you can try to uh, pretend that, I don't know, you're uh, creating some sort of, you know, beverage. And then you're just going to describe it either in a video or an online or whatever else. And then people will be like, okay, actually, that sounds cool. And I'm going to try it. I'm going to sign up, whatever else. But you can very quickly just see that actually if that has traction, instead of spending all that time and all that money, it's, you know, it's... Uh, the business model canvas, for instance, you probably all know it. It's kind of a good way of, of checking out which way you want to prototype, what type of customer segments, what activities. You can just prototype them and basically just finding a very, very cheap way of, um, of looking at it and not spending a lot of time. Whew, last, any questions before we move on? I think I have like five more minutes. No? Okay. Uh, last thing about prototyping and testing, uh, mainly around prototyping. What is a prototype? It's basically something very simple that will just get your idea across. That is it. It's just something simple that will get your idea across and you can share it rather than just talk about it like, uh, it's, 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 um, uh, I had it, oh, it's this, it's, um, you just create it, whatever, you draw it, you write it, you mock it up, whatever you want to do, just get your idea across. Why is it uh, important? It gets you to learn from your, from your customers, from your target audience. Like, ah, okay, that's what they like, that's what they don't like. This is what they would uh, prioritize, this is what they would not prioritize. Again, you can test it, you can just change it, you can test it, you can have it lo-fi, you can rip it apart, you can change, you can do whatever you want. And it's fun, it's really, really fun to see people, especially with like new tech or if you have a, a new uh, app or something, and they'd be like, Ugh. and you give them missions, like, hey, try to buy a plane ticket, let's say, and you create them and you show them an app, a mock-up of an app. They're like, mm, I don't know how to do it. It's fun, just observe people to, uh, when they're trying to do something for the first time. It's fun, and you can learn, and you can change, and you can do all of this. And it's actually so much simpler way of conveying your um, your story and your ideas rather than talking about it. You're actually showing something tangible. And we like, we're tactile creatures. We like to hold stuff and we like just to feel stuff and be like, oh, this is cool. We can press buttons and, and do all of this, you know. So we can kind of interact with it. We like that. Why? Again, it's very, it allows you to generate a lot of ideas and a lot of lessons and getting all of that story out uh, in, with your customers. It's just very easy and it's very simple. It's that show and tell. Instead of just talking to your customers, like imagine if you have a red button on top of a blue button on top of a yellow button, and they're all different sizes. You all probably think of completely something different right now. But if I would show you the three different buttons, you'd be like, ah, okay, that's what he meant about this, this design of these three different buttons. So again, don't talk to people about the ideas and the types of design, just show them. Again, we are on the other end spectrum from smart to not so smart show them and then just kind of uh, allow them to, to get there. You'll help you know, get the requirements definition. It will be uh, quicker with risks because then you don't create and build and put backend and put you know, all of these uh, codes on it in order to whatever you can just draw on a piece of paper. It's different ways, a sketch, a storyboard. So this is a, a great way to prototype. If you're prototyping a service, let's say, you just Take some post-its, just draw on it, this person. You do Lego, you do acting, you do whatever you want. You do something like this. You're like, oh, if this person does this, if this person does this, 
just to explain your concept. It doesn't have to be, you know, beautiful, it doesn't have to be, you know, a slice, it doesn't have to be anything like this. You can do whatever you want just to get your idea across. So, just to conclude, I think I will be just enough time. I hoped I showed you, I have 47 seconds. Ooh. Um, just I wanted to show you, you know, kind of how all of the different bits of design kind of come together. You'll have the research, uh, you will have, you know, service design wrapped around it. You'll have business design with new business models, uh, with new ways of, of making money, with new ways of working. How do you always uh, implement all of them together? You can use some of these methods, you can use all of them, but for different types of challenges that you want to use, there are some methods and some frameworks that are better than the other. So, hope you remember two things. One is that design is much more than just making stuff pretty. And the second one, it's we're more than just people working with post-its and we're snobbish about our MacBooks. Thank you very much. If you guys have any question, I think we have like 25 seconds. But if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take any questions. I spelled it right. Yeah, did I? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would go as wide and as low as possible because everybody likes to be included in decision making, right? Whenever your significant other tells you, oh, where do you want to go for dinner today? And you say, I want a Chinese. No, it's not Chinese. We're going to do this. It's like, why did you ask, right? If you already gave me an answer. It's like, People like to be involved in, a, in anything new, especially in their, in their companies and stuff like that. And yes, some of them be like, oh no, I'm just a back-end developer, I don't care about what's going on. But they don't understand that you know, they can actually start getting involved, they can start testing, they can start talking to users and stuff like that. Because then they will get engaged, they'll be happier, and then the product, let's say, if it's... Um, internal product, let's say, within a company, then you basically deal with the problem of adoption because if I helped to develop a product and that product goes live, I'm going to tell all my friends and all my colleagues that, look, this product, I helped, I, I, of course, I built that IKEA bed type of thing. And then kind of it spreads and spreads and spreads because it's easier to, you know, you build something like, ta -da, and CEO says, now everybody use this. Go use it. That doesn't work like that. And I think if you're done, do design well, it's, it's kind of fun because it's not difficult. Design is not difficult. So if you, inter you just get people involved from every single level in the organization, you'll actually get better teams. You'll start to getting know each other. Because again, best design is when you get people from completely different parts of company, different departments of different ways of thinking. You will get an engineer thinking with a psychologist, thinking with an economist, thinking with a mathematician, whatever that is. And then they're like, oh, okay, actually we have something in common. You know, so just to get these people together and just think about a common goal. We all like to work towards a common goal. So when you get these people and be like, hey, do you want to collaborate? Of course, some people will not, and it's fine. You cannot force everybody to do something that they don't want to do. Like, you have to now ideate, come up with good ideas now. And you have 60 seconds to do it. No, for some people, it's completely fine if they don't want to do it. Like, if you just seen this and be like, that was a lot of bullshit and, you know, I just wasted 90 minutes of my life. A, I apologize. B, you don't have to, like, I really don't feel bad that you don't buy into this because you don't have to. And that's fine. Anything else? No, then enjoy the drinks at 8 o'clock.